should be legal. You know, you see some amazing pieces of work that should be in galleries, but not everybody has, you know, that talent is appreciated. I do prefer illegal graffiti to stuff where there's a space for it because I think it's a bit lame. <laughs> they legalised it, it devalued it. As long as you have permission from the owner, why not? Banning it outright is the wrong way to go, but certainly yeah, a regulated approach to it. I think it should be legal in a sense that it's not like over the top on people's windows and stuff. I find it legal, why not? It's an expression of, of creativity. It's, it's not really the same if it's 100% legal and sanctioned. I've seen street art that's, that's really been very nice, and the question really becomes, how do you control the street art that's, that really adds to the community versus the street art that detracts from the community? I think it just brightens up the place when it's done well, not when it's just a normal street tag. Well, I don't find street art being officially commissioned, paid for, and done to enhance the area. I think it has a place everywhere, really. I mean, and, and I think once areas kind of mainstream a bit, the street art kind of moves to new areas. You know, we take, it has character, it has personality in it, and sometimes we connect to it. But if it's a piece of vulgarity, it would have to be funny for, for me to consider it to be street art. And I'm all for street art if it's um, uh, if it has some sort of aesthetic about it. If it's, it's pretty. No, it doesn't have to be pretty actually. If it's saying something. On the one hand, yes, it's a total commercialization. On the other hand, I guess it just brings it shows it to different people. I think it doesn't change the artist like or maybe the artwork itself, it just changes access. So as far as who gets who gets to see it or who who chooses to see it is gonna change. It takes on a different um, a different meaning when, when it's in a gallery or, or you think about the value of it. Oh, I prefer to see them uh, in the street. Maybe people appreciate it more if they see it in a gallery space because they that it's some kind of validation. It's sort of seen as art. I, I, I see no value change of the same piece of art if it's in the street or if it's in the gallery. Because it is a piece of art and a piece of art should be hanged the end of the day. It kind of gives, shines light on the artist, you know, to have his own, I guess, uh, exhibition. Part of the appeal of street art is that it's in a space that maybe non-gallery attendants go to or just you know, the regular public sees it. I, I love to see street art online, but it kind of promotes it. So when it comes to like uh, cities like London, Paris, and you see street art, I mean, it's like what I see online, so it's like seeing your favorite celebrity or you know, it's cool. One way it helps people appreciate it more, but in the other way it kind of um, discourages them from going out and finding it themselves. It puts on a big stage. It kind of, uh, I think a lot of street artists, instead of claiming a neighborhood or, or sort of um, claiming a part of town or whatever, they, they're now trying to compete globally. You perceive it differently when you're seeing something on a screen that's been digitized than when you see it in person. It's all pixelated. <laughs> it isn't the same. And it, 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 I suppose it brings it to a wider audience, but it's somehow, for me, I think it loses its value. A lot of the best street art I've seen has been people like Blue or these artists that, that even think about it in a video. Uh, just they kind of they're changing the medium from something you would ever see in real physical space. The clues in the name, street art, I think that's where it should stay.
and uh, or you want to study the physical, cultural, and social evolution specifically. So you can see this slide behind me and the video just shown. Once defined by the walls, road signs, and trade cards were spread upon, she art can now be found in the gallery space. It can be found in billboards, glossy tourist magazines, and progressively cyberspace. Uh, so our so by this we, we infer that street art and those who participate, manage, and arguably exploit it are undergoing evolution in form, space, and governance. Today we brought together an artist, academic, curator, and local representative to explore this evolution. So our aim is to promote new dialogue and to find new strategies to both understand and accommodate the street art in a result of these ever-expanding geographies. Before I briefly introduce them and pass on to our host and mediator, Luke Dickens, um, I'd like some housekeeping. So if you want to participate by Twitter, our hashtag is KTL Street Art. And uh, there's opportunity for questions at the end, so please save your comments until then. And this is being filmed and later uploaded to YouTube if you wish to relive the experience or share with others. Um, and there'll be drinks and nibbles uh, just over the corridor, um, a chance to carry on conversations. Um, so please don't find a way unless you want to do that. Um, and so moving down our panel, um, Next to Louis, we have Louis Massey, who is the, an artist and curator. Louis work both in the streets and galleries, where he explores issues threatening the animal ecosystem and the extinction of certain species. Most recently, this has formed the Save the Bees campaign, which you may have noticed we've been around shorts recently. And he's got an up and coming show at the Lollipop Gallery. Uh, next to him, we have Ingrid Beasley, the founder of Dulwich Outdoor Gallery and the Grow Up the Streets Festival of 2013. Ingrid will be discussing the intersections of gallery and street. Uh, for the ongoing exhibition, Ingrid invites a notable street artists as Stig, Rora, and Flem <coughs> to reinterpret re the classical art forms in the, um, of the Pitch Gallery onto the walls of Dulwich. She's also the author of Street Art Fine Art, um, a book that is available tonight for a discounted price, which highlights this link between art and the past and positioning in the continuum of art history. Um, at the end, we have Simon Baxter, who's uh, head of Tower Hamlet's Clean and Green campaign. Um, Simon will be sharing with us the position of Tower Hamlet's Borough Council has on street art in respect to policing and policy. And then, uh, finishing off the panel discussions, we have Lee Bofkin, who's the founder of Global Street Art, a unique artist led forum that holds the largest online street art archive in the world. Lee will be discussing the role of digitalization on the movement. He's also founded a pioneering walls project, which has organized over 800 <coughs> legal mules since 2012. Uh, so now I pass on over to our host and mediator, Luke Dickens, who's research associate at the University, who studies, uh, fast studies to focus on post graffiti between the uh, current street art and early of Mary's graffiti writing. Thank you. Um, some well-meaning provocations to speakers, 
uh, in the hope that they'll develop and respond to them in light of their own experiences. So while, uh, while it's common today to talk about the term street art, and, and to be absolutely honest, I prefer to do, uh, I, I found that the term post graffiti was particularly useful at the point in time when I was beginning my research in the early 2000s. Uh, and there's two related reasons for this. Uh, the first was a kind of historical usage of the term that appeared in the 1980s uh, in New York City, um, which was kind of used to kind of talk about uh, the, the death of graffiti, the end of graffiti, through the combined effects of an aggressive policing and cleaning policy um, that had really sought to eliminate graffiti on the streets and suburbs of the city, um, alongside a growing co-option of the graffiti writing subculture uh, as it increasingly found itself kind of caught up, <coughs> bound up in a fairly aggressive, corporately funded art world boom at the time. Um, so what was useful to my research then was the way that the term pointed to the way these kind of, and you heard someone in the, the film talk about these, these kind of competing regimes of value uh, in the city. The art world on the one hand, uh, and urban authorities on the other, um, and each of which served as a really powerful external influence on, on the graffiti writing subculture. The second sense in which I used post graffiti uh, at the time was the way it reappeared in around 2003, 2004 in a number of kind of chunky coffee table tents and hunting publications and books. These were written by authors such as Tristan Manco or Stephen Powers. Uh, and these were people that were close to the scene and they were grappling at the time uh, with ways to try and describe what they saw as these new directions in graffiti styles and practices. Uh, for them, these shifts were characterised by an opening up of the graffiti writing subculture uh, and towards more, more, the use of more diverse materials, techniques, influences, as you can see on the slide, so it's tiled, uh, it's sort of more site specific, there's, there's more sort of formally recognised artistic uh, canvas painting practices and so on. Uh, so, this use of the term was interesting to me because it suggested something of a paradox at the core of some shifts that, on the one hand, are profoundly different, more open, perhaps more what they, these authors at the time said, a visually literate, a figurative, and a site specific form of inscribing the city was replacing an older, more subcultural, perhaps more closed practice of graffiti writing from the past. Yet on the other hand, such authors also, also signalled uh, ways that this kind of spirit of this earlier form of graffiti uh, subculture had perhaps lived on after all, uh, albeit by evolving and mutating and becoming reanimated by a new generation of practitioners. <coughs> so it comes to kind of geography to post graffiti that I was looking at at the time. My focus on the spatiality of these shifts was informed by classic studies by geographers, uh, such as David Lay and Raymond Chabrowski's 1974 study of gang graffiti as territorial markers, uh, and Tim Creswell's 1996 work on the critical of graffiti um, uh, in his book In Place, Out of Place. Uh, Creswell, in particular, demonstrated a really important moral geography uh, taking place in New York City in the 80s and 90s where there was this really sort of fraught context of the value of graffiti writing um, and, and what he saw was this centering on where it was felt to belong. So using debates taking place in the press at the time, Cresswell showed that while urban authorities saw graffiti on the street as out of place, using terms relating to dirt and disease and even kind of madness, like these people doing it kind of somehow mad, uh, those in the art world saw graffiti as a tamed form of primitive art to be rendered domestic, consumable, and more acceptable uh, by being put in its proper place in the gallery. And again, you see those views really nicely in the video. When I began my research in 2003, the significant changes in the forms of inscription identified by authors like Manco and shown in uh, my past slide uh, had therefore raised really significant needs to kind of reassess this question of where and awareness, that where such interventions were occurring, how they were being situated and positioned, both literally and metaphorically and morally uh, by different groups. So in crude terms, my only work with the graffiti crews in Reading meant that I was really familiar with the kind of uh, the production of sort of extravagant masterpieces in so-called halls of fame. And on the left there, uh, that's an abandoned swimming pool in the middle of nowhere where graffiti crews would go on a Saturday and paint uh, pieces of work. Uh, or they'd be running around tagging uh, uh, railway lines and uh, canal paths and things like that. And I went with them, this is an ethnographic project. Uh, and incidentally, what I would say is that these activities were conducted by exactly the same people. So when people say the tags are mindless, uh, just point out that it's exactly the same people doing really sophisticated, talented work. Uh, uh, um, um, so 
so the same sort of people. So instead, uh, working with this, the London-based street artists, it was clear that their uh, work was producing much more visible, much more public locations, and often with really negligible efforts to kind of disguise what they were doing, sometimes even with the use of high-vis jackets and ladders and pretending to be ordinary kind of painters and decorators, and I saw that quite a lot as well. And so on the right there's Ben Iron poking painted plastic cups through a, a railing outside Old Street Station, everyone could pass. Uh, so, uh, to me, this kind of spatial distinction relates very much to a shift in an intended audience, or at least to the nature of the encounter, from a marginal practice directed towards other subcultural insiders, uh, and instead towards one seeking to engage with mass publics outside audiences in a sentence. So, nonetheless, it was really clear to me looking at both practices, and that was quite an advantage to see both. There was this, there, really, there's always no sort of specificity to these kinds of works in the form and the style they take, both in the way they're produced and also in the way they're kind of intended to be seen or not seen by others. Uh, specifically for the emerging street art scene in London that I was really lucky enough to be witnessing, uh, there were really some clearly significant changes in the kinds of spatial practices that were taking place, uh, and these were particularly in relation to the art world, uh, to the kind of global, local intersections of mediated space, uh, and the governance of urban public spaces. Uh, so, um, uh, before looking at some of these spaces, and I'm hoping that our panellists will, will uh, um, uh, elaborate on some of these reflections, um, it's worth noting here that in my experience, the kinds of people doing these kinds of street art often are rather different to the graffiti writers I knew. Um, not always, but quite often. Uh, so rather than being very young and in, in various ways kind of marginalised young people, um, London street artists were often older. Um, Broadly speaking, the ones I encountered were usually white and male. Uh, they were often trained in art and graphic design, formally, um, and were much more entrepreneurial and media savvy. Um, and that's quite a clear difference. Uh, so the contrasting images here would kind of illustrate this dis distinction, obviously a little crudely, uh, uh, but the point is to show that thinking about the backgrounds, identities, motivations of different groups of urban inscribers is really key to understand the kinds of images they produce. Um, what we tend to do is talk about street art as this kind of object that just exists without thinking about street artists. That's my point. So on the left is a really classic image from Norman Mailer's uh, Faith and Graffiti book from 74. Uh, I love this image. Uh, it's showing a really cheeky group of young Afro-American, Puerto Rican kids uh, who were the kinds of kids doing the kind of tagging on the summer in the 70s. Um, uh, and on the right is a screenshot from the do documentary Drawn, Scribbled, Scratch, Scrawled. Uh, by Toby Whitehouse and Philip Marshall uh, in 2003. Uh, and here we can see the artists uh, D-Face and Dave the Chimp. And here in the video, they're kind of aping the hip hop stars of the past. They're wearing baseball caps uh, and sort of using fake Yankee accents. Or they're blowing out their faces to have kind of illicit dimension to their personas. Um, and this for me really touches on the kind of post graffiti shift that I was looking at at the time quite nicely. So you see the kind of knowing nods to the past. Or simultaneously, these guys are making claims about contemporary forms of street art being more creative and edgy and dynamic. So, this is a caricature, uh, but it's worth reflecting on uh, street art evolutions here, as we're, we're here to do, uh, by thinking about street artists, not just the art, uh, and how they differ or might not differ from graffiti writers um, in terms of motivation, identity, and practices. Uh, so this is the point that I'm hoping Louis in particular might uh, pick up on since he's himself a practicing street artist uh, and how he uh, might see his personal biography, biography influencing the street art and vice versa. So, reflecting on new relationships with, with the art world, uh, the street artists that I worked with in my research were explicitly trying to respond to this kind of historical new sort of set up post graffiti. They're, they're really conscious of the death of graffiti and the process of selling out these people from what they're selling out that have characterised the past encounters with it. So, uh, one interesting response that I came across was working with the Finders Keepers crew and their Finders Keepers events. Um, and these were sort of 2003 to about 2005, um, and they, they invited street artists to seek out rubbish from the street and to transfer it for me into artistic treasure uh, before giving it away for free. Uh, from a temporarily acquired street gallery space. So this then was an effort to produce new forms of gallery space. Uh, it's a liminal space that's situated in between the formality of the art gallery and the authoritarian control of the street, uh, and thereby it's rejecting kind of both regimes. 
So in the documentary I mentioned earlier, I showed Dick Face and uh, David Chimp. Right at the end of this event, and it's sort of quite chaotic, and everyone kind of grabs the floor out of the ring about. And you can hear the D face in the, in the background, and, and you'll forgive me for swearing, but he shouts, Fuck the galleries! Uh, at the top of his voice, uh, as everyone's kind of grabbing stuff and taking it away. So it really sort of shows the, sort of, uh, the sense of the fear of selling out and the, 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 the need to kind of get out of it. Uh, over time, some of the very same artists, though, have established their own galleries. Uh, print houses and institutions. d was one that established Stolen Space Gallery, it's got a famous gallery now, and it's now moved to Big Blade. So in a sense, rather than selling out, uh, these artists in some senses were establishing new forms of autonomy and ownership in relation to production, exhibition, marketing, and so on. Uh, now, another response, and I've seen this only really with uh, working quite closely with Banks, ETT, as part of my research, um, uh, but his kind of notorious interventions into the art museums and galleries around the world really was very directly attacked the art world and he seemed to be attacking it. Yet again, this wasn't always what it seemed, um, and I was surprised following one example, uh, which was Tracy Banks' his kind of pepper and rock piece that he added to the collections in the British Museum. I was really surprised just at how much the museum really appreciated that intervention. Um, they liked the media attention and they saw it as a really excellent opportunity to foster much needed public engagement in their collections. Uh, so indeed, as is evident uh, throughout the history of art, you know, the classic way of being accepted as a central figure in the art world is to attack it, and we see that time and time again. Um, and then we all know what happened to Brexit. So, um, so my reflection point here with this ring grid, uh, and it's about the kinds of mutually kind of beneficial relationships between the contemporary art world uh, and street art and artists um, that can't be taken and how these might differ from past experiences and previous experiences. So, media spaces. Uh, with regard, regards to graffiti writing and street art, the role of uh, photographic media in particular has been critical for preserving and circulating an otherwise really transient form of street-based image. Uh, and this was particularly pronounced before the internet. You know, the internet hasn't always existed. But, you know, in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s in, in New York, there was no internet. Uh, and almost all of the graffiti writers I've talked to uh, uh, throughout my research uh, would, would point to the really huge influence of, of Henry Cooper and Martha Chalfont's book Subway Art, published in 1984. Uh, the, one was a photojournalist and another was an anthropologist, and they had independently taken pictures of the subway trains travelling through New York City at the time. Uh, and they were introduced to each other actually by the crew writers uh, and produced this book. Um, uh, and, and what I have noticed really is for many artists, this was really taken as a how-to guide um, for emulating US graffiti writing around the world. And I would say this is probably a major reason, this book in itself is probably a major reason why so much graffiti writing looks the same. You can go to S Spain, Germany, Lithuania. There's a heavily coded form of graffiti writing that we've seen. Uh, and the subway itself was also a really extremely innovative media technology in its own terms, I'd suggest. Uh, uh, bringing the margins into the centre, the invisible, into high visibility uh, by carrying the names of these Puerto Rican, Afro-American kids in the Bronx uh, into the wealthier, whiter neighbourhoods of Manhattan. And now the Bronx in the 70s was an abysmal place and very difficult to grow up. And so in a sense it was giving voice and visibility to very, very marginalised young people. Um, and I know that Lee, you suggested, I watched your TED talk, <laughs> uh, and you suggested that this was kind of like the internet, I think it's a really interesting idea. Uh, but, but maybe it isn't. Uh, uh, and, and in a sense, the, the way the subway works is it gave the public no choice but to see it. Um, and more, moreover, they experienced it viscerally. that you'd get on the train to go to work, and the inside of the train was bombed. Uh, Tags, not bombed. Um, uh, uh, um, so it was a really kind of visceral experience, and in a way, perhaps that's the opposite of how many of technologies work. I, they seem to offer a more kind of remote and disembodied encounter with street art as, as the digital image. Um, so that's something that would be nice to hear your, your thoughts on as we go. Uh, in my research, the way street artists in London use media spaces follow two main themes. Uh, firstly, it focuses on the emergence of a number of creative businesses, such as pictures on walls in Shoreditch. Uh, and they use the web platform to sell street art screen prints around the world. Uh, and I also follow the kind of networks of fan forums and eBay collectors and 
the secondary market that built up on the internet around these reproductions of street art. Um, uh, and that took me to very interesting places. So, uh, secondly, I became really interested in works of, of artists like Banksy, who really seem to be using the media as a central element of his work, of his street art. It's a really integral part. And that middle image, really, I mean, that's um, uh, one of uh, the, the staff and pitch on which has got a working relationship with Banksy. At the launch of one of Banksy's prints, briefing the media on the kinds of things they might like to say or look at or capture. And I saw that sort of thing all the time. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, you know, when uh, Banksy's got a show in LA, the week before he goes to the show, he uh, reworks Paris Hilton's album and sticks it in the shops as a kind of subversive act for where does Paris Hilton in, in LA. So, there's this kind of media presence to that kind of work. So, um, uh, but that's obviously not the, the full story, and that's the sort of limited ways I was looking at the media, and I'm hoping Lee can add uh, insights to more recent advancements and the relationships between globalisation media, digital media, and street art. And media. Uh, so as I mentioned about the traditional approach to uh, graffiti by urban authorities has been to equate it with dirt disease and even madness, uh, and thereby uh, deeming it to be out of place in the city. Uh, this is the kind of broken windows thinking that's remained focused on the kind of dual practices of cleaning uh, and zero tolerance policing according to the law. Uh, so, for example, on an open time Hamlet's website, uh, uh, they note that all graffiti is vandalism, plain and simple. So, you know I'm talking to you, Simon. Being a street artist, 
Um, so I started using the word Maasai about six, seven years ago. And five years ago, I moved up to London to try and become a part of it all. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'm an artist, um, but I don't, I'm not just about painting on walls, I also paint in the studio. Um, and I use brushes and I paint on paint wood. Um, so yeah, um, I paint about animals, which you can see by this image here. This is actually in Miami, uh, and it was for Miami Art School um, as part of Art Basel. Um, it's not there anymore, which is how everything happens when you paint on the wall. The next person comes along and paints it. Um, but they told me that maybe next year I'll be painting again, so who knows? It's just like a constant um, cycle. So um, when I paint, I like to look for a human attribute to give my pieces. So in this case, um, the bird sat on a pencil. For me, what's cool about that is that it's a really organic way of reminding the viewer that actually a pencil is a piece of wood and a bird sits on a piece of wood. So when he sits on a pencil, it's not actually that strange, but actually what's quite strange is that we're chop uh, chopping down the trees to make pencils to then put them to disappear and to put into the bit and so on. So I'm always looking for like a human attribute to highlight as something that's kind of ridiculous. Um, so there's another one here. This one's in, the last one was in Bristol. This one again is in Miami. Um, and a lot of my creatures are about um, endangered species. So this was all hashtag last of my kind because these are critically endangered birds. There's only 250 of these guys left, I think. I've forgotten all the statistics. Um, so um, this is another style I like to work with is if you look onto the, on, on the underbelly of, of this gazelle, he's got African cloth, it's a kenti cloth, and I like to look for um, African, well, I like to look for cloth, cloth textures to link in the animal to where they're from. Um, again, it's another way of linking in that idea of what human attribute is, and it raises an awareness of why the humans wear fabrics and clothes and so on and so forth. It seems ridiculous that an animal would have this brightly coloured fabric on it, but is it any more ridiculous than us wearing clothes, which actually quite often reference nature as well. So um, that's kind of where I'm going with, with that. That's the whole wall. This is always a huge wall. Um, that was for Upfest two years ago, which is a big um, paint town in Bristol. Um, and the gazelles are hanging up. Um, the the, the Garanuk Ger gazelles, I believe, I think that's what they were called. Um, and they are hanging up um, four creatures which are really super dangerous. So you've got the silverback gorilla, uh, vulture, prairie dog, and the rhino, all of which in the next 10 years won't exist on this planet. So the idea was that these guys who are a little less endangered are hanging up their friends and sort of raising awareness about that. There's um, a closer detail of it uh, with the fabric in the ears. Um, so another thing that I like to do, I'll just go back to here. If you look at, I don't know if you can see it quite clearly, but if you look in the neck and on the belly, there's loads of my tags in there, uh, which you will also see in the parrot, in the parakeet head. So what I like to try and do is, I like the idea of referencing my medium, uh, which is spray paint on the walls. And when you think of spray paint, you think of graffiti, and when you think of graffiti, you think of tags of maybe vandalism. And so I like the idea of using my my moniker as a way in which to remind people that it is actually referencing also my medium. Um, and in addition to that, it's also it's a nice way of adding style and flavour, and it also looks quite a lot like um, fur or feathers crafted as well. Um, so this is a piece in Philadelphia, um, and this one actually manages to bring together all three of my styles, I guess. Um, one is the human attribute. Uh, it's actually a Pacino. It's based on um, the Hopi tribe, which is a tribe that is dying out. So uh, again, I'm referencing a human attribute, but through the animal, I'm talking about the endangerment also of a whole human species. Um, so the Kachina doll, which is the, the doll's head on top, um, they use those for worshipping their, their sort of their gods and so on and so forth. So, the eagle is very important for them because it flies above and it's a very spiritual element to their whole practice. Um, and then they've got the beads which they use and they chant and they wear and so on. Again, that's something that humans wear. And then the fabric patterns are um, the Hopi tribe uh, fabric patterns. And then there's thousands and thousands of tags in that piece. Um, so I went 
to South Africa about two years ago. Uh, and this was a collaborative piece I did with my friend Casey, who's from, um, from Johannesburg. This is actually in Cape Town. But I went out specifically to South Africa to paint about endangered African animals. Um, it was the first time I started to paint about endangered species. Um, and I didn't really know why I was doing it or how it was going to turn out. It was just kind of a series of work that I knew I could focus on. Um, I can't even remember how many I did, but this is actually the blue crane, uh, which is the national bird in South Africa, and it's, it's vulnerably declining, and people of South Africa aren't even aware of that. Um, so what was really cool about painting these different African animals in an African country was that the people were directly engaging with me because I'm painting on the street, because you're within a community. Um, it's really cool because you actually get to meet the people that are going to live with your pieces. Um, these pieces are still up, some of them being vandalized a bit, but they're still there. Um, and then, you know, a big impression was, was I was being left with a massive impression of what my work can do to raise an awareness within the community. Um, and actually, it didn't stay within the community. It then got blogged about on about six different languages. Um, and that was my first taste of what the internet could do. Um, when I came back to England, I wasn't just Louis anymore. I was someone different because people actually... Had, it's weird. When you leave the country and then you come back, people give a shit more. It's as simple as that. Um, and equally, when you leave the country, the people where you're going to seem to care more because you're from and somewhere else. So it was a really good way for me to raise my profile doing that trip. But I came back with a fear and a shock that nobody in this country knows why and how and what we can do to save rights. Um, these guys are being slaughtered, like, slaughtered, murdered, whatever you want to say. They are they're dying and we're doing nothing about it in this part of the world. In South Africa, every single day, they're campaigning about this and they're talking about it and we're saying nothing. So I came home and I was like, I need to paint a big wall. That's how I do things. <laughs> so um, I got given this trackside wall, actually. Um, it's actually an illegal piece, um, but I knew the guys that run the pub, so they said, yeah, paint it. They gave me a bit of money for the paint. They, gave, they hired um, the scaffold, it took me five days to paint it, or four days, but they don't own that building. So it wasn't a legal piece, so, but it's still there, and it's kind of cool, it's a nice one to leave with. Um, so I realized that I really enjoyed this idea of putting a point across and raising an awareness, but I wanted to do something that rung home a little bit more to the people within, not just this country, but something that every single person around the world can identify with. And the one thing that's the most important thing on the planet are the bees. So it seemed really, it was so it was just like a, a, a no-brainer really, just to paint bees everywhere. Because you can paint a small container within an hour. I could do seven bees down one street in a day. Um, so I did. <laughs> um, well, I started it a couple of years ago, and last year we went for it big time. I did it with another artist called Jim Vision. Um, and we just went through the whole of Shoreditch, Bethnal Green, um, we just went everywhere um, and painted bees. Um, and it's gone insanely viral about six times. It's just gone viral again three days ago via uh, an online art blog called This Is Colossal. Um, and when it happens, my phone just like literally blows up because it's just Twitter. It's just... So the internet is, is, is an amazing place for, for being an artist right now. Um, so this was, uh, this actually was a commission which happened because of doing the campaign, uh, that's in Devon. Um, and through doing this whole project about bees, um, environmental agencies started to get interested in what I was doing. So I've been speaking with, what well, I've done a project now with Synchronicity Earth um, and the IUCN. The IUCN, interestingly enough, I'd spent the last three years going onto their website to get data. So all that data that I wrote on walls in South Africa was from the IUCN. And now two years later, the IUCN contacted me and asked me to paint paintings for them, which I was like, wow, this is cool. Um, so um, we, it was a really organic 
approached um, Laura from the Sick Ministry, uh, called me up and said, Hi, I'm Laura. Um, I want you to do something for us. I was like, Cool. Um, so, what would you like me to do, Laura? I don't know, Laura, you make it up. Okay, cool. Best client on the planet. Um, I was like, We're going to paint um, 10 walls in seven days. I don't know why I thought that would be a good number, but I thought it would be. And it was hard work. People, I'm sure, understand how hard it is to find 10 walls and paint them consecutively in seven days. Um, Camden got a lot of them, Brick Lane got a few. Um, where else did I paint? Brixton. Yeah, it was good fun. Um, but the idea of it was that all those species were all animals that were interlinked with British culture in some ways. So some of them were endangered species, that the British animals, some of them were extinct, some of them were reintroduced, uh, some of them were invasive. So I'll just flip through the scorpion. There are like, you'd be amazed as to how many scorpions live in the UK. Um, the lynx is one that is, um, they're talking about having it reintroduced. Um, the American bullfrog, um, it eats all of our frogs and it will wipe out all of our frogs if we don't stop it. <laughs> it's huge, it's about this big. Um, it's just like four Americans, no skin. Um, so, uh, the stag beetle. Now, I actually have really personal fondness for the stag beetle because when I was about eight years old, I used to think that they were little shits and I used to go out with my tennis racket and beat the crap out of them. So um, I didn't know what I was doing. They're now really endangered, but <laughs> so I was kind of part of that. So I really, really enjoyed putting up a painting of a stag beetle and being really proud of London for being a part of the country where they're thriving, uh, which is strange because you think nature doesn't work in the city, but actually it does. Um, so yeah, stag beetles are coming back, which is really cool. Um, hedgehogs, um, really endangered. Um, the dragonfly uh, is actually extinct. This particular dragonfly, it's an orange spotted emerald. They've got such technical names, I forget them all. Um, this is a top map gudgeon. Um, he's invasive, eating all of our other fish. He comes from China. Um, the common crane uh, has been reintroduced, one of the most successful reintroductions of species. Um, in the UK, and so that's pretty cool. It proves it can work. Uh, parakeet, if you live um, in London, which I'm guessing you'll do, I'm sure you've seen like flashes of green and you've gone, whoa, what was that? And they are parakeets, they live in, in, they live in London. Um, they're very invasive, they're kind of fun there. Um, so I'll go on to the next project, which I'm going to be doing with Synchronicity Earth, is going to be about the coral reefs. Um, and again, Laura phoned me up and said, Louie, I've got an idea. Um, okay, Laura, what do you want to do? I don't know, you make it up. So I said, okay, cool. Let's fly around the world. Um, and I'll collaborate with different artists around the world and we'll do pieces about the coral reefs. So this is still in the making and um, if you keep an eye on the internet, I'm sure you'll see it. Um, but this I did in New Orleans. Um, it's based on a uh, patchwork quilt toys. So I like this idea that um, Raising the point that if you don't look after the environment and different species and so on, there will only be um, replicas and toys um, running out of time. <laughs> um, so my whole, I'm doing a, a whole solo show at the moment, which is about sort of referencing that idea and that notion that if you don't look after what you've got, there will only be toys there. Um, so that's a bit bigger. Um, more of the toys, that was a closer up with the other piece. Um, I wanted to just quickly show you some of my studio work. Uh, that's from a different show, Afro Fabrication, just to prove I don't just paint walls. Um, that was also Afro Fabrication. Uh, this is Last of My Kind, it's a really endangered birds. Uh, that was all interlinked with musicians. Um, this was a commission that sold to the South African Bank. Um, so, I know I'm running out of time, I just wanted to get to the point that I wanted to make it. Um, the creative movement that we're currently sitting in has been coined many things from outside art, street art, graffiti, graffiturism, and I'm not really sure um, what it is that groups all of us together. Um, but due to the heightened appreciation for these styles of art and the artists' stardom like Banksy and Obey, it has become a lot easier for people like myself who are unestablished or becoming established to have that slight breath of fresh air where we can actually make it as an artist and survive. I don't do anything else, I just paint. And that is only happening because of the people that have done it before and are still maintaining to do it. Um, so that's really super cool. Um, 
This is another commission. This is a commission I did for um, a collector in Philadelphia. Um, now, again, this highlights the importance of what media does because I only got flown out to Philadelphia because somebody saw a painting that I did of an African prairie dog three years ago with Lee in Brick Lane. Uh, someone saw that um, and flew me out a couple years later to do some paintings for him and his friends. I've been out. Yeah, no, that's the one that you got to now. <laughs> um, but no, I know the one you think of. That's the, the, uh, the other one. Uh, so, <laughs> um, I've been flying out to Philly three times last year to do pieces. Um, that's another one. Um, so, yeah, it's cool. Uh, so, basically, the point I'm making with that is that because, because we're paint. <laughs> The, the easiest way to explain it is that through the media that people who wouldn't normally witness art, see art, can suddenly become a part of art. Um, and because the people that follow us, taking photographs, and they fall in love with what we do and how we do it, they become a part of the wall and the pieces, they put it onto their social media and more people see it. Which means that it's a continual evolution, which means that the greater audience feels like they can become a part of that. And because they can become a part of it, because it's not in a gallery, it means that the prices come down, which means that people can afford it, which means that it then has a knock-on effect. It means that people who don't actually necessarily want to charge £10,000 for a painting can charge £1,000 for a painting. They can make money, the person can buy the art, and then it continues to snowball. So that's what's really cool at the moment. Um, so, yeah, everyone's included, basically. There isn't um, the idea of, um, a security guard or a box office or an exit sign. No one is asked to not to take any photos or to touch the work. Uh, the audience can become more emotionally attached. They can watch it being created. Um, talk about. Let's get rid of that. Um, so, <laughs> this is another. I'm running out of time. This is another commission. This is my last image. Um, this is something <laughs> cool. Um, so bearing it, th this all into mind. Um, I, I put forward the notion that actually we're living in a social media art movement and that we can call street art, or, and what we call street art or anything similar coined is in fact probably yesterday's movement, just in the same way as graffiti became street art. I'm, I don't call myself a street artist, I'm just an artist, but I use the media and I use social media in particular to promote myself. So I think that I'm a part of a whole new category movement and I'm calling it social media art movement. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry to talk to you.
moving onto the streets of Donish, some really famous street artists who had based their works on these boring things in the picture gallery. It would encourage street art followers to come to Dunwich, um, following their idols, um, discover hopefully that these works are based in Dunwich Picture Gallery and go to the gallery um, to find out what it's all about. If it inspired street artists, it could inspire them. So it was really to attract a different demographic to Dunwich Picture Gallery. But there was a second um, reason as well, um, in that most people that live in Dunwich had only ever heard of one street artist, guess who, Banksy. Um, they could not name another. And they knew absolutely nothing about street art except they had this um, idea that it was vandalism um, and antisocial. And so I tried to introduce to Dulwich the top street artists in the world um, and just to prove that street art, is, art can be beautiful. But I had to do it in a very subtle way. And if you see the art in the playground here in Dulwich Park, the two artists there, those walls, by the way, were given to me by Southwark Council. So they're really on board with this. Um, the stick and the Thierry Noir, these rather simplistic works that work very well with the playground. And so I was curating all the time. Um, here, for example, um, there's a rather beautiful Madonna and Child by Murillo up there on, in, in the gallery. And that was dragged out onto the local pub, basically, where um, the Madonna has been made into a, an every woman. She's um, uh, multi, multiracial, basically, and she's strong, and she seems to have a strong baby as well. <laughs> um, anyway, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. Okay, now, what could be more subtle than this? Street art doesn't have to be big, and it doesn't have to be brash. And in many places, it doesn't work if it's big and brash. So here we are um, with you know little subtle bits of stick around the place. And people love it when they discover um, works like this because they're not in your face. They come across them unexpectedly. So this is what happened, basically. I invited the street artists to come into Dulwich Picture Gallery. And they were you know, dead keen. Virtually nobody said no. Anyone I approached who was free um, came. And you could You'll see Thierry Noir, there you'll see Roa, Mad C, um, Christian Nagel. Um, they also, if you look at their phones, actually, it's a bit rather than the pictures, but they did look at the pictures as well. Uh, there's um, Ben Wilson, who paints chewing gum on the left there, and stick up there. So there they were doing their homework, um, a bit more homework. Um, and I'm now going to read out quite a lot of um, quotes that I've gathered over the last couple of years because you can, you don't have to take it from me that it's been a very good uh, project, that it's worked. But I'm also going to read out a few anti ones. It wasn't all pro, but I think it was about 90% of people that I talked to or um, the evidence that I got loved what was going on in Dulwich. It was astounding. So here we are. We felt incredibly proud to be part of a, a cultural event that saw so many people getting involved. And this is a, a development company that gave me lots of awards on the houses that they were developing. One of the driving factors in our property company is um, how to make the areas in which we work better, believing that regeneration is more about communities and people than just shiny new buildings. Um, this is actually my favourite. It's David Schillinger, who's um, interpreted a Samson and Delilah there. Big scissors, um, lots of tears, uh, lots of eyes looking on. Okay, and this was on the side of a pub. We felt very lucky to be involved in this project by providing a suitable space where art could be presented to cause such interest, debate, and enjoyment. <coughs> the high standard of the art has sparked new interest and understanding about street art among the local communities and beyond. Okay. Um, there's, <laughs> there's a little, there's a, a, a short film, but I'm not allowed to show it because we're running out of time. <laughs> With Stick and a local person. It's very funny, but you can look at it, up. You can look at it on YouTube. Um, so, yeah. That's him using the drain pipe for that. Um, Dead tree. I'm going to interrupt. OK. 
okay, we got Connor Harrington down to Dunwich, which was wonderful. I was so pleased about that. Um, and there's a forum called the East Dunwich Forum, which is just renowned for everybody being nasty about things. So, um, basically, <laughs> they weren't always. I absolutely love it, except um, uh, expect a, a lot of sightseers to Spurling Road. I'm going to sell teas and coffees. It'll be graffitied over in five minutes. They won't get very far without a cherry picker. I'm so impressed. The mural is absolutely wonderful. Do go and see it if you haven't already. Connor Harrington is an amazing artist, better than Baxi. We are so lucky in East Dulwich to have this piece of artwork. Waste of paint. <laughs> I live near the dueling men and saw it going up. Love looking at the giganticness of it every day. I love that word, giganticness. And that's what it looked like. And it is probably, the, the, as far as I know, the favourite piece in about 25 pieces that are around Dulwich now. But the community does get involved, and if the community doesn't like a piece, off it goes. And here, um, poor old Discreet interpreted a rather violent um, original work called Judith and Holly Furs. <coughs> and there's Judith. She has chopped off the head of um, this, this soldier, Holly Furnace, and it's dripping with blood, and it's quite realistic, and it is quite horrific. Um, he made it into a cartoon, and um, the head was just, you know, his head, because mainly he paints owls. Um, and, but the wall owner didn't like it, and it had to be painted over. And what she preferred was this, a rather beautiful gay stag. It is rather beautiful, actually. Um, St. Sebastian is the gay saint, um, and he knew that. Anyway, but that is just an example of the local community having um, a real input in what goes on around Dulwich. Now, spot the street art, to talk about subtlety. Can you see the sheep um, between those two houses? I mean, there's a bit like that around the place, and it's just great to come across it. Um, the street artist made friends with the people, of course, that they were painting, whose, paint, whose walls they were painting, and that's Stick and um, the little owner of the house, and there he is at it, and they were a little bit scared of him, you can see that, um, and they just peered at him to see what he was doing. However, he attracted other kids from down the road who just turned up in their pyjamas, um, didn't know where they came from, and there they were, um, absolutely fascinated by what's going on in this very residential area. Um, ben Wilson always attracts people wherever he goes. You know, you see a guy lying on the pavement and a painting chewing gum. Well, you know, you've got to have a conversation with him, and he's very good at chatting and loves it. He is in the Dulwich Picture Gallery grounds, the hallowed grounds of Dulwich Picture Gallery. My God, that's the building on the right-hand side. He got in there. Dulwich Picture Gallery isn't that key on what I'm doing, actually, which is most odd. Um, but he's there. Um, now, this was a sweet story. Um, here's Flem. Um, here's the local community coming to me and suggesting walls, OK? There's a tatty and tagged big wall on Goodrich Road near Barry Road. Um, it's a real state and really needs improving. Have you got an in with the wall owner? I didn't actually, but I, had, I found out who she was. Um, could you persuade them it would be a fine use of his or her space if it were to be painted over nicely with a lovely new mural? Well, Flem did it, which was fantastic. However, Flem was terribly sensitive to the environment. He went to Dulwich Pitch Gallery. He decided originally to um, use that rather gory painting as a starting point. It's the skull and a dead body in it. And he started to paint it, and he'd done a few hours when he realized that actually there's an awful lot of um, ordinary families and little children passing by. And it was on a school run, a primary school run. And he realized that this was completely inappropriate for that street. And so he decided completely himself, without counting <coughs> from me, but I was very relieved, I have to say, um, to take a detail from um, another painting, a guy playing a round trumpet, and interpret that. 
and that has gone up and down so well. Um, and there he is with his um, with the son of the wall owner. He allowed him to help paint. And this is the mum. Flem's mural and all the others I've seen so far are just great. My son Caius loved giving him a hand, and I'm so grateful to him for uh, letting him have an input. He feels proud to be part of it, and now feels very protective towards the war. Well, I do find that quite a lot. The more um, input the community has, the more they feel it's their war, and they want to look after it. Um, Roa, poor Roa, he was given a portrait wall as opposed to a landscape wall, and he does animals, and so would prefer to do you know, long um, flat ones, uh, landscape ones. Anyway, he chose to do this dog. Um, it, this dog has caused more controversy than any other wall in Dulwich. He did, it's a shitting dog, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> you can see, um, he took, it's a detail of that um, 17th century painting that actually does have a shitting dog in the middle of it. But when, um, you know, it's acceptable then, and it's acceptable in Dulwich Pitch Gallery, but here it's not so acceptable on the wall of a pub. But some people like it. So here's Dulwich um, Forum again, East Dulwich Forum. The rat on the side of Victoria Inn from Bellington Road is rather grotesque to me. I thought it was a weasel. I think it's a dog rather than a rat. Yes, a scrawny dog. A scrawny dog trying to have a poo. Mmm, lovely. It's art, isn't it? I expect um, they're here to stay. Nothing a gallon of Dulux won't solve. I think the same people are coming up again and again, actually. Um, I like it. It's got to be better than a brick wall. The dog rat is kind of weird, but all right as well. More power to this street art. Not quite shortage, but pretty cool. It's pretty good for Tully. Um, you may not like it. You may not even think it's art. But the fact is the same has been said about almost every new art movement before it becomes more generally accepted. I love the cracking dog. What does that say about me? Um, Pablo Delgado, who does those little pay stops, um, absolutely charming. Here he is taking elements from different paintings in Dulwich Picture Gallery, chopping them out, and making little scenarios, little stories, um, combining them, and then he adds shadows um, to the pavement. So when they wash away in the end, which they nearly all will wash away, you can still spot where they were because there are shadows there. Um, this was a lovely story in that um, on the left is the original one that you've just seen. The council came along, I think probably didn't even notice it was there, painted over it. And then somebody else, some member of the community, had obviously taken a photo of it or something, and they did exactly what, pa uh, what Pablo had done. Um, and restored it. They cut out their own little bits of paper and stuck them to the walls. They did make them far too small, actually, and they forgot the picture on the top left. But that is an example of the community restoring their own walls, which I just thought was lovely. <laughs> Christian Nagel, the mushroom man, he has actually got into the rather famous independent school, Dulwich College. They came to me and they asked if um, I could recommend a street artist to do a workshop with the boys. And they loved Christian. And here are his mushrooms, or maybe they're the boys' mushrooms, um, in the beautiful playing fields of Dulwich College. So I mean, street art is getting um, you know, into, I don't know, all, everywhere. <laughs> uh, OK, I'll speed it on. Um, hidden walls. This one was actually given to us by Southwark Council. It's the back of the tennis practice wall. Um, and here's Ingrid B. I'm, that's what I am on East Dulwich Forum. It's great to see this art in our neighbourhood. Thanks for the variety, for getting people talking and opening my kids' eyes to artists I see every day in town. <coughs> Brilliant, all of it. Lots of boring walls and buildings brightened up. Okay, schools come to me now. Um, mainly primary schools, but sometimes secondary schools as well. They want me to lead walks around the, the streets and then end up in Dulwich Picture Gallery um, to show the children the original works of art. And the children often find the picture gallery boring, but when they've seen street artists' interpretations before they come, it's a different matter. 
So here we are, street art tour, uh, certainly opened my eyes, my, my mind, and provided a real insight, a deeper appreciation of modern art. This is the deputy head of a local school. One child commented, I thought it was going to be boring, it was really cool. And Stick gets on so well with um, children, with everybody actually. He's really charming. And he completely charmed this, this group of primary school children. So this is their class teacher saying, working outside with a street artist was a new and exciting adventure for us all, for us, and such fun. It was inspirational for all, uh, for the children to see art happening before their eyes and to feel a part of it themselves. An experience they'll remember and be proud of for a long time, I'm sure. So we really do involve the local community in Dulwich. Here's a Peckham wall, that, um, a community wall. Um, I take walks, I'm asked to take walks. This is, look at the age group in this walk. Um, these are mainly local Dulwich people who are finding out about street art. Um, and, you know, they're quite old compared to most people that take street art walks. And they're loving it. Yeah? Okay, Japanese. Big, big walks to Dulwich Picture Gallery. Wow, look at that. 80 people we got in there. Um, this is the second last slide, I think. I have to say, it's really quite inspiring in terms of putting a modern interpretation on old masters. Um, I have never really heard of Dulwich Picture Gallery before, but I've since taken a gallery tour and loved it. Um, okay, just these last points. Why do people love Dulwich Street Art so much? And these are the points I put together. There isn't too much of it. It's carefully curated with the environment and the local community in mind. It's subtle and not rash and mindless. It's of very high quality. It's in unexpected places. And it involves the local community. OK, and I'll leave that out because we finished. That's the end. <laughs>
Um, and um, it, but it's, it's a fascinating place to be. Um, and to understand the council, you'll understand our approach and uh, some of the stuff that comes out of this uh, shortly. Um, so, so um, yes, it's fantastic. So, current status is graffiti. Um, for me, um, and, and, and I, I suppose I remind myself that actually I'm speaking on behalf of Dr. Um, but it's yours. I try to get an extra bit of me and, and the council, but um, so I'm very uh, civil servant. Um, graffiti is, is, is described in the English Oxford Dictionary as an unlawful mark. And for that, that for me may be the solution for some of my problems, whether it's lawful or unlawful. Uh, so you just have to bear with me. Um, there is um, a big connection between graffiti and crime, and uh, crime and crime agenda. Um, it does relate, tag, it does relate to um, gangs, steel, uh, drugs, and burglary. And um, this is not something I just picked up off the internet. It's actually stuff I've experienced. I'm out and about and see stuff. PYG, you don't know anything about PYG, but it's Peckham Young Guns. When you see that in Bermondsey, you've got issues. But Peckham Young Guns shouldn't be in Bermondsey. DFA, no, with Africans. This is all the stuff that I get to see. So the crime and crime agenda is important, and um, people need to understand that I've also got a statutory role to keep the streets clean. I'm driven by performance indicators. Um, I'll just tell you one little story. Um, I was on the train going to Manchester and uh, I'm sitting next to some elderly lady. So she said, oh, so are you going to Manchester? I said, yeah. So it's my gunners at the home office. She said, oh, right, okay. So where do you live then? And I thought, oh, okay. I said, Camberwell. She said, oh, that's nice. Sorry. I went, no, 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 not sorry. I said, it's between Brixton and Peckham. She said, oh, that's a terrible place to tell. I said, that's nice. I thought, yeah, I live there. <laughs> so it's quite near Dublin, actually. Um, so, um, but it's not that nice. Um, and um, I said, so where do you live? Orpington, dear, Orpington. I said, it's lovely, Orpington. No, no, it's not, it's not safe to go out at night. Why is that? There's graffiti everywhere. And I'm thinking, hmm, is this a plot, you know, for the home office? Um, so it was interesting, her perception of, of, of coming out of her where she lives, I'm not coming out of where she lives, was restricted by the amount of graffiti that was on the streets. So I thought that's quite interesting. So there is, there is that link. The other thing that I've got to work towards is government targets to keep our streets clean and local targets. And there's then a whole political, um, I was saying earlier that I, I've, I had to write two reports, this was a public realm group, um, why we've not hit our graffiti targets. And I'm saying, well, we've not hit the graffiti targets, it's got a real policy in place. So it's, it's all a bit loose. And, and that's not good for me. But we are um, trying to develop a policy. We had last year uh, a stakeholders group um, where we had, I can't, there's one guy, give me a surname, which is Dave. Um, and he promoted, um, do you know Dave? <laughs> you do know Dave. Did he come from your group? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we'll give me a surname. And he said, oh, yeah, I prefer going that. But, but, so he was saying, he was promoting the good stuff. I would describe some good stuff. There's another guy who promoted the artist, and the two of them were arguing with the stakeholders group uh, about tagging is actually art. And the other guy goes, so no, it's not. I'm thinking, well, you can't even agree. We're trying to get you, would you accept what art is as a, as a basis to develop a policy? So we try to be inclusive, involve people. So I've, I've got quite a difficult job in keeping the politicians happy, our residents happy, businesses happy. And my boss has been in it, and it is tricky. I, I described it as walking on eggshells with um, on rice paper and eggshells underneath. It's just, uh, so I, I, it is difficult, and, it, and, I, and I try to say to the group last year, work with me, try and cut me some slack, because I, I, I want an easy life. Okay? I want to earn £300,000 a year, or a week would be quite nice, um, but I, I, don't want, I don't want all the pressure that I have to have to, to get this sort of thing that you're seeing up. Um, on, on your screen and um, sort it out because we spent a lot of money, £800,000 a year previously, dropped down to £200,000, our budget has been reduced. I've had to make savings in the last four years of over £26 million in my environmental budget, so we've been hit hard. And, and what I need is to, to work um, in conjunction with some groups to make stuff happen. So, yeah, right. 
think just purely because it's really interesting. Right, so considerations, the space of demographics in history. Now, the, the history of, of Tower Hamlets plays an incredibly important part in street art and or graffiti. And if you knew that in the 1700s, the British Huguenots came into the borough, the lace makers, and then the Jewish community then came in, and then the ben Bengali community came in, and it's changed again. So it's got a history of being very transient, constantly changing. Now, understanding that, we'll understand why there are tensions when we have type, certain types of art or graffiti in the borough, what's acceptable and what's not. And I'm trying to work policy around that, and how do I fix and recognise art um, to that graffiti and keep everyone happy. So um, it's quite difficult. So understanding the demographics in the history is important to how we frame the policy and then make things work. Because I do want to make things work. So, the beautiful elephant I love. And as I say, I, I, I was a very firm believer in zero tolerance until one Saturday I had to go look sadly for kitchens. So I, I took the train to Shoreditch and there was a graffiti tour. Do you guys do graffiti tours? Yeah, not in Tower Hamlet. <laughs> and, and there was a graffiti tour going on. And I was, I was in good community, I suppose, only in, uh, yeah, in disguise, just as a civic. And uh, this guy was up and, and there was some beautiful artwork going on, I, I have to say. And he was saying that how come that there was one graffiti person who got banged up for five years for criminal damage? He said, yeah, um, sure, we'll get three months. <laughs> Something mm, interfering with children, three months, graffiti, five years, it didn't really step up. It started to me thinking, I'm look, looking around the borough, around Brick Lane and Shoreditch, I'm thinking, actually, some stuff is very, very cool. And businesses also buy into it, because there's a lot and safe company in Bethel Green Road. Uh, and rather than just having boring shop run, they've got this huge piece of artwork that looks like a safe. So when you open the door, and it's just really cool. So, the councillors and some, some of us, the officers, understand and appreciate the beautiful elephant. However, what we don't like is the stuff on the right hand side of the scribble. The one in the middle, so the one on the bottom left. Nice. What do you think? Nice piece of artwork. Just a quick show of hands. Is it gorgeous? Is it sexy? What does it do for you? Okay, well, no show of hands, so I guess that's a yes. Um, and that actually caused a lot, a lot of problems for me. The guy came over from LA um, just, bless you, just before the Olympics, and I had some woman speak to me. I'm like, you want to take this down? So, yes. Why? I said, because I'm getting complaints from the police um, and from the community. Well, what? It's a great piece of work. I went, no, it's not. You don't understand that borough. You should be in this borough. And the reason it caused so many problems is that the people around the table earning money off the backs of the working classes deemed to be Jewish. That caused a big, big problem in my borough because we have a no place for hate uh, and it is very diverse. If you understood the history, the tensions between Judaism and Islam, and everything else are different communities, the Bengal community versus the Jewish community, the no place for hate. That caused me problems. And as, as, as I'm sure it's a beautiful piece of art, but do you know what? We can't have it. And, and that's when we begin to um, think start to unravel what is acceptable and what's not. So yes, we can enforce. I do have a statutory function to fulfil, but it's not what I think is the best way forward. I think the best way forward and um, acceptable is understanding and working with important groups to say actually this is good, this is good stand, this is what we want, this attracts tourism, it attracts trade, uh, visitors and um, you know we would encourage that. So finally um, where we're at, this is quite an interesting game for me. We've done a more survey so I have to I can't I have to be careful because the policy that we're developing has not gone through the council machine yet. So it's, I'm still in report form, I've still got to take it through uh, 
the corporate management team, I still have to go through to the councillors and get approval. Um, but we've got some really positive stuff on Maury. And I was surprised at this because only 20% of our residents actually wanted um, uh, zero tolerance. Um, the rest actually understood and accept the value of high quality pieces of street art. Um, and I thought, okay, that's really, really good. And they want um, the PT art zones. Um, so that's some of the really uh, more stuff that are you interested in. Um, we had a really good event last year, the St. Holmes event. We had the Maury stuff. Now, this gives, gives me the the picture that I can paint to members, to councillors, to say, look, this is the direction that we want to go in. Because I've had some direction from the Mayor's office. Um, I think their words were, um, we just want to get rid of the crap. Um, and I think that this is the stuff that we saw earlier. This is really, really good. The, the Chihuahua on the right is in Christian Street. Um, and that's beautiful. And as is the cranes near Brook Lane. But interestingly, right down at the bottom of the Chihuahua, yeah, it says, um, gentrified. Yeah, gentrified. So that's a shame because I think it's, there's those who don't know, there's about 300 million pounds going into there um, in, in the next 10 years, um, into Christian and around there in, in the regeneration of uh, the new housing and um, stuff. So I think it's really, really neat. And it's something that I think the council wants to understand and appreciate, but it needs to be done in conjunction with working with us because if you don't, there's going to be issues. I don't wish you around the for around the table because that's just not acceptable. Um, it, is a, you know, it is a great place to be, but you need to work with us. So I hope you found that as interesting as the rest. It wasn't as sexy as yours, <laughs> nice birds, but um, it's the best you can get out of local authority. Thank you. Social media, 
uh, an artist will sign up and upload their portfolios from about 100 countries. Um, we share their photos with the fans and try and drive them new fans. Since 2012, we've also started something called Walls Project. Uh, we've organised over 900 uh, street art murals in Tower, uh, if it's Tower uh, in, uh, in, in London, but we are directly responsible for organising, I say organising, not painting, um, organising about half of the street art, probably a bit more to be honest, uh, in the Brick Lane area since 2012. Uh, and we've never actually worked with Tower Hamas Council, and Simon and I have never met, and that's really quite funny considering how much we've, we've done that, but it's all through uh, local landlords, and ironically, uh, the bottom chapter is actually also Tower Hamlet's, that's Crisp Street Market, where we've painted uh, a load of shutters, and that's on Henyard Street, and that's the back of Star Yard. In fact, all three of those photos are in the glorious borough of Tower Hamlet's. Um, the, the third side of what we do is we have an agency that does hand-painted advertising. Uh, and if we're going to talk about public space towards the end, I should probably talk a bit more about scrutinising advertising, because that's actually one of the most dominant forces in shaping your impression of public space, and it would be a bit of a mistake if we didn't notice it today. Um, now, we do advertising, so uh, that makes me evil in some ways, but we'll talk about that as well. Um, but this is in uh, Brighton uh, on the right and in Birmingham, and that was a project we did for Gilux. And we do lots of things like that. We also paint commercial interiors and stuff like that. Um, we also run events. Um, this is projected live art battles supported by tablet makers Wacom, which was at Cargo, which is in Hackney, so I won't talk about it. Um, so I, I, I usually start talking about uh, a history of graffiti and that trains had a function of the internet in the, before the internet existed, if you painted on the outside of the train, it took your message to a different uh, part of the internet, but what Luke, a uh, different part of the city, but what Luke pointed out before, which is very accurate, is in public space you don't get a choice over what you consume, it's just in front of your eyes, you can't walk around uh, with your eyes closed. Uh, but funnily enough, in terms of advertising in the transit system, I'd like to challenge anyone that got here today by tube to try and go home without being advertised to. It's bloody impossible. Um, but think about that as well, because it is important. So one of the things I hope we can get out of today is uh, changing our language or, 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 or seeing if we can build on our language and doing things that probably come across more progressive. Uh, one thing that um, Hackney's struggled with, and I know Tower Hamlet's I'm sure has as well, is choosing words, because graffiti is not a simple semantic concept. Uh, neither street art, they all encompass such things as an art form, but also a crime and potentially a subculture and possibly some other things. So we deal with the art form and the crime elements uh, not there, um, but those confusions can make it quite difficult to have a conversation with people, because you'll find if I'm talking about the art form and someone else is talking about graffiti as a crime, we're often coming from different points and, it, and, and it's not necessarily the most constructive. Um, we have a, a book, Concrete Canvas, that came out last year, and there's three major trends in macro space, uh, within street art, two of them I'll talk about first. One of them is the changes in, in the art form, sorry, so three trends in, in street art. One of them is the changes in the art form. Uh, a second part of it is, is changes in facilitation or organisation. And it's interesting that as top-down organisations, municipalities and councils are trying to reach down, there's also a lot of grassroots organisations all around the world that are trying to build things up uh, and, and help support artists in different ways, and that's facilitation. So. Uh, graffiti, writing your, your, your chosen name in letters, hasn't been static, that's moved uh, along a lot and become more technical and more colourful over time. Street art, which people traditionally associate with stencils, has also moved on and is far more progressive and as Luke alluded to, there's been an expansion, an explosion of techniques and materials and today there's just about no <laughs> technique or material that can't be used and one of the reasons that this form of social media art is so shareable is because it makes great photos in context. The difference between this kind of art and gallery-based art is in the gallery you have a very neutral environment and it doesn't make great shareable sort of funny photos because it's the, it's the white cube of the gallery system. Outside, where the context is not so neutral, you can do really interesting things and they really fit that public space. That has a lot of its impact because it's unexpected and because it's outside. The original reason for showing that is this slide is it's not about the kitchen sink, but there's just about any material in the kitchen sink that you can use to make art. Um, so, uh, the second side I want to talk about is, is um, aesthetic trends. So, we call it all street art, but it's, it's a really ridiculous term. It's a catch-all term, actually, for a lot of different kinds of art and a lot of different aesthetic traditions that all happen outside. Uh, and a terminology has moved on a lot. Uh, instead of perhaps street art, you might want to also consider a phrase, art in the streets, which is just the fact that it's art that is outside in the public space, uh, or, or a different space. Um, street art often gives images of Banksy and a genre, a visual genre of art form, but you can expand it and think about actually what happens if we have a lot more different forms of art in the streets. And it was interesting to hear Louis 
uh, talk about um, him being an artist who also happens to enjoy painting walls outside, but why anyone should feel constrained to making art inside or outside is, is somewhat a bogus notion. And we find it quite exciting when we get to work with people that have never worked outside before, never done something on the streets, and, and how can we encourage those people to more actively participate in public space. So in terms of different visual trends, reinterpreting past masters, works of 3D, uh, realism, that's a very popular uh, uh, subject area, uh, interpreting fonts, font-based work, not so hard to read graffiti, um, but things based on kind of 1950s sign writing, um, which you know was how adverts were originally and is an art form that's being rediscovered in the digital age, because as this stuff becomes more shareable, uh, it's much more interesting than PVC painted billboards and things that are quite intrusive in public space. If something's hand painted, you can more appreciate an element of skill. Um, and that's one impact that digital has had, is actually on the commercial side. So um, other trends in what's writ large called street art include things like calligraphy uh, and, and abstraction. Street art is also, you know, as I alluded to before, it's different from gallery-based art. It's very sensitive to space. And these pictures are just some examples of what happens when artists do things that you can't do in a gallery because it doesn't have the same context. But you can do it outside. The walls don't have to be regular. In fact, you don't even need walls. You can do things on bridges. Uh, and there's something beautiful about street art is that it can, at its very best, make you look at your city in a different way. It can make you look at a space not necessarily as a bridge, but your, your disused spaces, your unused and unloved spaces, and often the most hacked spaces are the ones we get easiest permission for, where you can do things that, that really are imposing and beautiful and impressive. Um, and this is uh, uh, the, the second major trend. So that was all the stuff that's changed in the art form um, and how it's been affected and impacted by being painted in the city. This is, you know, also shows um, uh, a beautiful canvas where street art looks great. This ship doesn't sail, it doesn't work as a ship, it's in Wales. Um, but it's a great canvas for art. Uh, but this is the Black Duke project in Wales, and it, and it typifies a second trend in public space related to street art, which is what I've said before, facilitation. Uh, and it's not just in London. In fact, London's a very small city, I think, for street art comparative to some other cities around the world. There's loads of street art festivals in the world now. We've totally lost track of them. Uh, long may they continue. But what street art tours often miss, and I wish they'd probably say, is you don't need to, uh, you can be involved in shaping public space even if you're not an amazing artist by working with artists. Uh, and I find that is quite empowering. And people, I have no talent, discernible talent as an artist, but if I can get some talent as a mediator and help my friends who are talented paint walls, well, that little 1% contribution we, we make, allowing artists to do the 99% contribution they make can be really empowering. And there's loads of examples uh, around the world of how street art festivals or mural arts festivals, uh, Dulwich being one great example, have really contributed to those spaces. This is Sino Evil Festival in Bristol uh, on Nelson Street. And Nelson Street was behind the courthouse, was a disused and somewhat on Love Street. Uh, all of the tourist buses in Bristol have now changed their route to go through this street. It's now got the pop-up cafes. And unfortunately, the symbols of gentrification, because some levels of street art do sow the seeds of their own destruction, in that if you make a place much nicer, a lot of people want to move there and then the rents go up. What I'd like to advocate today is that street art, or, or rather art generally, and I'll get to this at the very end, shouldn't be an art form for rich areas or poor areas, but we should have more of it everywhere. Um, and, and so there's plenty of other examples where people kind of somewhat agree with that. This is in Cardiff. Uh, these are some of our pieces um, that, that we've organized in the last uh, couple of years. The one in the bottom left is at the South Bank Center, grade one listed buildings that invited us to go and paint wooden hoardings, not, not permanent, but the pieces are still there now. Uh, and it, we've turned a small space um, behind the South Bank Center, which was a thoroughfare, into a destination site. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, or one of them, that's not true, I'll probably talk a lot more, but I'll try and be quick at least, um, <laughs> is advertising. So uh, billboards are very prevalent in public space. They're a fair detractor of public space um, because like street art, you don't have, it's not democratic. You don't have a choice over consuming it. It's just forced into your eyes. Um, now, I'd like to think that some advertising could hopefully enrich public space. Uh, it's a very contentious question. It might not be true, and, and maybe I'm wrong on this, um, but we seem to have a more fond nostalgia for sign writing, and I like the idea that uh, we could have, you know, if we are going to tolerate outdoor advertising, we could have some that's less intrusive. This was a project we did in, in Hackney uh, on the Olympic Park um, for the space. It's an advert. I make no bones about it. It's got a hashtag and everything. Um, but this photo in the middle got more shares on our Instagram feed, 40 odd thousand fans on that, than any photo we'd shared previously because visually it was so good. And the theme of this 
piece of uh, com this commercial mural. It's not street art, it's a commercial mural. Um, the theme of this was Disrupted Inventors, um, and it was a very uh, popular piece. Now, this was something we, we finished a month ago. Uh, this is in Islington, I believe. It's on the Clerkenwell Road and Goswell Road. It's an advert for a paint company, Valspar. Um, and they wanted to show that people could be bold and the choice of colours for the materials. So we painted a trombolone, that was the idea. So it looks, from a certain vantage point, like you're looking into the house, but it is a mural and it's a commercial mural at that. Um, other pieces that we've done, I'll, I'll see it. But, um, so, as Tower Hamlets and Hackney, or the Shoreditch area, changes, we are losing a lot of walls. And with the popularity of Street Up, there are more artists competing over fewer spaces. And, and just about anything where the private landlord could give us permission, we've painted. Funnily enough, in, in your presentation, there was a photo that was just here from Slater Street, uh, outside Shoreditch Junk. We paint that now, and it looks a lot better. Um, but, we, but we've run out, you know, kind of running out of spaces around that area. Um, so we had it was a harebrained idea, and, uh, and we'll see how this works out. Um, but we ran an article with Big Blog Londoners to nominate your neighbourhood for a street art festival in July last year. Seven neighbourhoods came forward some of which we didn't know, um, and Broccoli won with 900 votes out of 3,500, so we've committed to doing a street art festival there. Um, just to show you how mainstream and accepted this stuff is, uh, with partners we won a £50,000 grant with Forest Recycling Project from the National Lottery last year, and we are now painting nine big walls, three in Tower Hamlets, three in Hackney, and three in Waltham Forest at various points this year. This was in Hackney, this is the first wall, this is now finished by Italian artist Pixel Pancho, and we've got eight more walls to go. Uh, that's the South Bank Centre I mentioned before at the bottom, and the top side is a car park we were essentially looking after, curating, supporting artists, facilitating, what have you, uh, and we put up all of, organised all of those murals, um, artists from all over the world, and you know, Circle, Run and Never, Mysterious Owl, Roan and Woozy in the bottom right. And I, I think it's probably more important because we're talking a lot about ourselves, but they're doing all the hard work once we've got permission. But this car park was closed down and now we're painting the hoardings around it, but in a year or so we won't be painting. So one of the things that we'd like to see happen in London is about hoardings. Um, so blank hoardings, is, I find that actually visually quite dull and a little offensive. Um, so a lot of people may say something about that as well, but of all the paradigms of hoarding, that's also not a good outcome. So blank hoardings, I think, are quite dull. Um, you know, tagged hoardings, lots of people, or, or, or things where people don't have the time to create, where it's illegal and probably not the most inspiring spaces. But there's a necessity sometimes to paint quickly if it's illegally. And so um, if people can, you know, and then this happens afterwards. So here's the hoardings we look after. We look after two city blocks of hoardings. Um, but we, our name is not on any of it, so you wouldn't know if we exist or what we do to this space, but we've laminated the signs. Uh, the building site signs, so if they get tagged, we can kind of clean them off. Um, but generally, the space looks after itself. Uh, these are different views, that's from uh, London Live, but different views of the same audience. Um, and London, there are many cities around the world that have lots of um, beautiful street art. Um, uh, this is uh, Lords and Poland, and if London wants to maintain its reputation as a cultural capital around the world, it probably, you know, it's, it's great that there are an increasing number of opportunities. Um, Starting now, that was where I ended the last talk. I'm gonna just go on for if I've got two more minutes. Is that maybe, cool? Maybe one more minute. One more minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, well, uh, Bertrand Russell said there's two kinds of goods uh, economic goods and shared goods. Shared goods by the production of more of them, more people benefit, and that's kind of how I view sort of street art that generally, to some extent, more is better. But again, we get into conversations about quality. I'm interested most in increased access to public space, not only high art, the best art but having more people have access to paint, even if they're okay, but maybe not amazing, or spaces where they can practice well. Uh, and, and a healthy city probably has all of these things. And we're aware that, you know, with increasing access to public space, people feel increased belonging, increased ownership over it, and that's part of citizenship. Um, to, to, to finish on a point, um, I come from a biology background originally, and there's two factors that you'll hear about in evolution. One is emergence, and the other is natural selection. And in any kind of complicated system, both things can happen. Emergence is when you have the interaction of non-conscious uh, subunits, like individual artists, and that gives rise to higher order properties. When our hoardings get tagged, artists, even if they don't know us and haven't asked, will selectively paint over the pieces that have been trashed the most, and to quite a large extent that we don't need to do anything. The, the artists are smart, all, there's enough maturity. Uh, when you reach a certain threshold, they can look after them spaces themselves. The natural selection is the top-down part, which is the things that we can do and the things that municipalities can do to make spaces better, like laminating buildings, like signs. Um, it's that kind of thing. Um, and then, just the final point then. 
Um, it's interesting to hear Simon's point on administration and that you have an administration burden as well. And within the budget of your £39 million, having to deal with the frustration uh, of, of what your cleanup is and what that means to you has been something that we haven't, I haven't heard about too much before, but it's pretty obvious. But it's very interesting to me how, in various councils actually, the decision over what art gets to stay and go often falls in the cleaning department. Um, and I find that quite interesting. Um, you know, I, I hope that there's still space for artists and other people to be involved in what those policy decisions look like. Um, you see, that's it. Thanks.
also there are rules in graffiti now. I'm not a graffiti artist, but I know the rules. And if there's a tag, you do a bomb. If there's a bomb, you do a piece. If you do a piece, you go from top to toe. If you take someone out, you do the whole wall. So if I'm going to see a wall that is covered in tags and bombs and throws, I'm going to do a whole piece on it. So it's going to get dulled because there's like there is the ownership of the wall. But the point is, is that if you was to work with more directly with the artist so that we are more aware of where those walls are, then your problem of having a degenerate wall can be fixed a lot more amicably, cost you less, and you can actually be helping to feed a young artist to make the space look better. It, 100%, it, it, I'm going to respond to that actually, because that's such a, there's a nuanced thing, like it, you're, you're absolutely right, but there's a will to get there, but there hasn't necessarily been the mechanisms, and I don't think Simon's saying that he's even against that kind of thing. Even within graffiti though, there are rules for people that will break rules, because that's part of the point of it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and good pieces will get tagged over, and some of that value is in its change over time. I think we need to re-educate people to be less threatened by it. There's a major distinction between gang graffiti, which is a very small minority, and tagging and, and, and graffiti graffiti, which is tagging where you're going over a wider area to get your name known and you're not so localized and to, to mark territory. Um, and there's a generational issue as well. A lot of older folks were, went through the 80s where the narrative around graffiti was very much in a similar of urban decline and urban decay. And we were taught to be afraid of it. And it's no surprise that that worked because that's kind of a media narrative that went along with it as well. I think where we are getting to a point today is there's an increasing opportunity to start, because we're not there yet, to start the dialogue where some small spaces could be potentially given over to being rolling, rotating art spaces, fingers crossed, um, from, from sort of both sides. I just sit in the middle of everyone, and, and, and I, I think there is, we've got quite a, a hopeful environment, where I think there's more opportunities for both of what you guys are saying to probably come together. So that's 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 why, just, just that's to rewind, because that's, I think, my, start, my starting statement was, Prior to me working at Town Hand, it's zero tolerance. Yeah, yeah, no, so no, no, you're, no, you're, no, you're, no, you're no, no, because of what I've learned, yeah. and I've evolved. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, down this third theory, I'm trying to get into a position where that we can do exactly what you're suggesting, or at least suggesting, is that actually, and um, when Lee was talking, I'm thinking, I want to come to the cabinet meeting. I've got to give over the something you made or even give us a paragraph about actually what what the value is because I can see that. Um, and and the more that we can work together and understand it, each other's roles and responsibilities is going to be so much easier for me. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I'm saying, because I'm in a lot of what you say, I just want it off. And it is about the political will. Because that's well, it's good. Good. It's it's good. Good. You can understand that there is two sides to the coin. Yes. Because uh, at the end of the day, there are so many people that are so low is low, and that's the end of the story. And you, you can say no, you're not going to stop them doing it, they're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've spoken to graffiti writers who will say, you can plant trees and bushes in front of the walls, and we'll pull them down, and we'll still paint the wall. The, the that's not helpful. It's not helpful, but, 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 but it's not, it's not, the town hand is a way of doing things, or my way of doing things. I'm very transparent, I'm easy going, and, and, and the, the authorities are quite laid back. They recognise the good stuff that they want to work with people and, 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 and to get rid of the, the rubbish. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm this, sure my work is given being clear huh, on the role's responsibilities. I don't think it would be an issue. My, 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 my question, or not question, my, my plea to anyone from any kind of like governments on this, wherever it goes to, is to cut out this word good and bad because as soon as you determine that a tag or a graffiti is bad and street art is good, all you're doing is, is that you're, you're creating that distance greater where actually we all need to work together. And as soon as if you're calling tags bad and, and dirty and ugly and, and degenerate, they're just going to come and dog over our pieces, which means that we can go and invest lots of funding, time, and energy and effort on doing a beautiful piece, and then it's going to get gentrified with the bottom. So, yeah, that's what. And that's what will happen. So it, you need to be very aware of the fact that if you want to stop, uh, you, you're never going to stop it, but you need to figure out a way in which to bridge it more and stop yeah. that battle. Back in the day when I was 17, 18, there's a, a group called Parliament, and um, the, the guy who, it was one album called Dr. Pumpkin's name, and he said, if you're not part of the problem, you must be part of the solution. I think we've got to work together yeah, yeah. because it, we, I think, yes, problem and solution, I think that's in the same part. And mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, I understand what you're saying. That's, 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 that
Well, certainly in Dulwich, um, the community has taken over looking after the artworks. And um, if they, as, you know, the example I gave of them putting up more um, stickers, and I have people communicating a great deal by the infamous um, East Dulwich Forum saying there's a tag here, and you know, will you do something about it? And I do. And, and basically, we look after our own artworks, we don't rely on anybody else to do that. So I just had a little thought because you were saying oh. about communities. One, there was um, just before Christmas, uh, a, a local business, it's a film producer, um, Ben Gordy film producer, had Jeff. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Do you know what I'm trying to talk about? Um, I know. But yeah, but he, he so he had this beautiful mural piece of work, we are going to call it, on, on his shutters. Um, and I don't know why, but some, there was the all seeing eye, this was just one eye. And it was seen as anti Islamic, and that just blew up, and that all went wrong. And, and I got blamed for some of it, and I'll explain why I got blamed for some of it. Um, uh, not for, yeah, well, okay, I'll just do a bit of time. So, because <laughs> I'm thinking all through my head, anti Islamic, um, so young, some young uh, Bengali kids come and, and through paint and whatever it. Um, so, then someone complained that there's graffiti on this man's shutter. Our contractor then went in and all of that, they painted it over. I think that's what happened. The guy who owned it went ballistic and wanted the, an investigation and the, the police were at the hate, the hate crime unit were involved. I got pulled in, I think he like, what's gone wrong here? And um, when we looked at the CCTV footage, you could see our contractor painted it all over, thinking the whole lot was graffiti. When he was only complaining about the bit that had been I think wrong, so they just chuck the hanging over all the eye. So it does become, if, you know, sort of some, unless you understand that community and, and talk to us, some things become bigger problems than they should be. So again, it gets back to being open and, and talk to us because actually we are a very more forward thinking authority and you have got some good people, not bad sheriff, good sheriff, um, in, on your side and understand what to work with. That's really nice. That's really nice to hear. I mean, what we, what it feels like it's a really interesting moment right now. It feels like, in a sense, we kind of moved on from the sort of days of zero tolerance of very sort of black and white thinking. But at the same time, there's, there's this really sort of rich sense of sort of entangled values contest. In a sense, you know, it's not really clear where that's going to go. Uh, it seems like you know, people in Tower Hamlets, eighty percent of them are kind of into it. Seventy. Seventy percent kind of into it. You know, you have to show Street artists are thinking about ways of working more commercially, galleries working out. So there's some interesting things going on. I mean, the organisers tonight, one of the uh, questions that they wanted to kind of really get at, I think kind of just quite naturally did that in that exchange, was how to kind of reconcile and accommodate these different kinds of values looking forward in terms of the, the future of governing cities, and I think that came across really well. Um, trying to stick to the revised Time you guys are great. Yeah, you guys are great. You've got like five more minutes, and I think. Well, I'm, literally like, I mean, I'm, I'm just conscious that we're talking a lot. <laughs> 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 you all sitting here patiently. I mean, what would be really nice? Can we try and gather uh, some responses, some questions, some yeah, insights? Yeah, you can go ahead and turn it to the audience and take a couple questions. If anybody has something that they um, would really like to ask, right here. Um, I'm Robert. I'm a master student in the geography department here at Kings. Uh, thanks uh, for all your chats. I'm uh, really it. Um, I come from uh, New York City and I live in East London, so uh, I've always enjoyed following graffiti or street art or social media art. <laughs> <laughs> Arts and streets is the last uh, reference today. Um, whatever you call it, I think it's, 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 it's fun to, to, to follow. Um, and I, I, I'm familiar with the Dulwich Picture Gallery, but not the Dulwich Outdoor Gallery, so that was really uh, enlightening. Um, especially to see the street artists that I'm familiar with um, to be inspired by uh, classic uh, art. Um, and it makes me wonder, um, in this day and age, where some of the um, street artists are going with their inspiration, uh, particularly with a uh, corporate partnership. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe in the Renaissance era, you had the Medici family as the corporates uh, who were commissioning Da Vinci or what have you. These days, I think it, you see things like um, Martin Bilarkey or, or Penfold, uh, who um, designed the Chuck T canvas, um, uh, Converse All-Star uh, 
trainer. Um, and all campus, um, Commerce All Stars, they used to be um, made in the US. They were bought by Nike and now they're manufacturing some factory in China by God only knows who. Um, and then you have the Shepard Ferry poster up there, the Obama campaign. Um, and so basically, my, my, my question boils down to is um, can the, the essence of, of street art uh, still be retained? Um, in big uh, corporate uh, partnerships. Thanks for the question. Okay, well, well I'll, I'll, I'll be very keen to answer that. We'll hold that, that take my take two or three <laughs> more, and then you put them to the panel together yeah. so that you get more discussion. Uh, anybody else with a question? Yeah? I was trying to hear those, those rules of curfew. The rules? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. 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 I didn't know all those terms. OK. Uh, and so maybe that's one for you. Uh, yeah. It's like the, 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 the side. You probably be better at it because right. you took, you probably know a lot more graphics. We'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll riff all that together. We'll <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're well, moving one for um, uh, Ingrid. I'm nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some more Christmas. Is there another one over here? Uh, my question is, I guess, about inclusivity, and a lot of the time you guys were discussing the potential for street art to um, incorporate <coughs> the community and people, etc. Et That's how I'm going to say it by going through street. Artists and pieces of street art, you find that it tends to be dominated by a certain group depending on their location, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm just curious about how how street art could potentially, or you know, whatever moniker you use, uh, can change in, in a way that could become more inclusive. Um, what does that be for gender, people, age, even? Yeah. Um, around street art, and yeah. I'm sure, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of any 80 plus year old participating in create, the creation of street art, so I mean, that was a lot of show. Yeah, I'm sure there are two. So that's, that's, that's a great question. So that's about the kind of inclusivity, yeah. the sense of yeah, inclusivity yeah. around yeah. Maybe that's sort of uh, Ingrid and potentially Simon, but we've got even more quick one. We've got one over here, one over here. Um, uh, with this, with the deciding what's good art and not good art, you know, in the state making that decision, which is always been the case, you have you know, national cultural institutions that decide what art comes yeah. from in our uh, society, and, and that's, you know, it's just taken on an outside basis rather than living in the gallery, which is understandable. But um, I suppose my question is what are your fears within that in terms of street art's history has always been? Not necessarily overtly political, but certainly a voice of the marginalised. And um, as it becomes more beautified, and the Dunnish project is wonderful, but it is very specific in terms of class and very controlled. Um, and it, the, the entire Hamlets, you have all these um, new developments, developments you put up buildings like even much uglier than any tag you've ever seen, but um, have co opted that as part of Urban Cool, and then made the music and called in your apartment avant garde house, for example. Um, and so it's stabilizing it and removing that voice. And so I suppose my question, if there is one within that. It's about, it's about politics and voice. Right? Yeah. It's, it's about visibility and politics voice. And yeah, how do you and, and, and can that be kind of, uh, you know, what, what role of power in the state in shaping that? I mean, you're talking about high art, low art, political culture, from the grassroots. Yeah, and are we just sort of neutering me? Neutering and, uh, and silencing. Okay. Good question. Uh, that can come across us all. I think I can answer some of that. There was one more. Uh, my question is about curation and what role the community is supposed to have in curation. I think, Simon, you mentioned how ideally you'd get like a board of community members deciding on what they want to say or not. I think that fun functions of the, the knowledge to a certain extent, but then again, it's you that selects the artist and so on. Yeah, I, th I think you have to say a bit about this as well because I know you have the curation issue coming up all the time. So what, what's the balance between the individual decision factor of who curates and the community factor? Okay. That's a great question. So we're going to do this. We're all having such a great time. We're going another five, five six minutes, and five, six, seven minutes. Yeah, you get to uh, uh, So I think what we should do is do some quick knee-jerk gut responses. Uh, so we've got the, uh, the role of commercialisation, which I just it would be good to hear from me. Um, so, yeah, well I, th I think this can all come out in any one order. But, um, <laughs> all right, just on the one 
thing. Um, no, it probably can't, um, is the short answer. If it's if the essence of street art as you define it is about some illegal or rebellious nature, by it being subsumed by a corporate body, it does lose that, I think. Um, but that's not to say that it's totally illegitimate for being something else, or that there can't be an art form in it, or that it can't be good for the artist and for the company, um, but it probably does lose, uh, I think, some of that essence of what sort of street art is supposed to be about. However, it doesn't mean that that's excluded, and this goes to quite a few people's points. I don't think that we've necessarily exclusively sterilised, because that means that we've removed the environment for the illicit or illegal. That's, I think, influenced by other things. I think what's essentially happened is you've got a broadening where there are increased opportunities for legal, for murals, for really kind of higher end street art festivals. Um, I think that the stuff that sterilizes or impacts the more open end where anyone can participate, authorized, unauthorized, good, bad, legal, illegal, in public space depends more on the legal environment framework and the cultures. Um, so if you've got a culture where more kids now are tweeting at each other instead of writing their name on walls, well that sterilizes that illegal side of it. If you have a more draconian punishment as a, a punishments, if you're, you know, North Korea kind of style, to make a very obvious example, that will totally sterilise that access to public space as well. But I don't think that necessarily that there's been a broadening in one end in, in the mural arts sort of festivals necessarily impacts what other people are doing at the other end of the spectrum. But at that, that other, another part of the spectrum, the corporate end, that again is a different end of the spectrum, which is not the same as that kind of uh, free for all entry. Great, covered. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, so public engagement opportunities for engagement. I think that's maybe one we both might touch on. Just, just sorry, just yeah. your point. Is that our, our, it's difficult, and that's what I started off with. I'm not a bureaucrat. Town is very open. It's a very complex community with lots of sensitivities. Um, probably one of the most politically dynamic. Yeah, we're going to talk about it as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah
it off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 